So I've actually been saying this for years with agents that I coach that bring up this negotiating tactic that we're going to talk about in today's video and how it can backfire. And that being calling for a highest and best situation when you have multiple offers on your listing. Now, I have been, like I said, been saying for years and years and years and years of selling so many homes and being on the listing agent side of the equation and quite frankly, the buyer side as well that highest and best isn't always best. And in many cases, it's actually worse for the seller and worse for the buyer. And there was a recent article just put out on Inman where a, a team leader from California talked about some really, really interesting points that I thought, wow, this that, that he is 100% spot on. And I want to share those with you because whether... You have been in the business for a long time, or most of you, I think, are, are a lot of you rather, are, are newer to the business that look at the highest and best situation as the norm, when in fact it is not. It didn't ever used to be. And so let's get into this and I'll share with you why and some things that you might consider that might make you a better negotiator. That might make you get more listings, that might make you get, uh, do a better job for your seller, and as a result, have a better experience with the buyer's agent writing the offer on your listing. So first off, I think it's important for you to understand the, 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 the history a little bit. And the article talks about this, that before the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, before there was a bunch of foreclosures that really took over the marketplace, we really were in a REO market where everything was either a short sale or a foreclosure. And before that happened, if you had multiple offers on a property, the way in which you handled that negotiation as a listing agent is much different than how we handle those today. The article does a great job of explaining that. So here's what he said. He said the process of negotiating multiple offers was fairly straightforward. He's talking about before the great housing market crash of 0708. If two or more offers came in, the listing agent typically took the best terms from all of the offers, the highest price, the shortest contingencies, etc., and crafted them into a multiple offer format that raised the bar for all of the competing offers. As a buyer's agent, you could count on all of the terms in the seller's counter to have been in at least one of the competing offers. Although it took some work on behalf of the listing agent, this practice offered a level of transparency and confidence to buyers. The competing terms were on the table. And if the buyer wanted to sweeten the pot in a subsequent counter offer, they could do so by submitting a counter offer to win the negotiation. So in other words, how it used to be was if we had multiple offers on a listing, let's just say five offers on one listing, those buyers and those buyer's agents would have some visibility into all of those offers. And we'd be, get, we, we'd, we'd be able to really negotiate. And the buyers would have transparency to, because they would say, okay, let's just take for an example a listing that's 400,000 and they got five offers. Well, as the listing agent, you can go back and say, listen, here's where we're at. Are you Mr. Uh, uh, buyer's agent? You guys are at 395. We've got an offer at 405 right now. Are you willing to go higher than that? Now, once the buyer had that information, the buyer then can make a decision and say yes or no when they had the information. What happens now, because here's the counter argument. Well, how is that better, Brandon, for the buyer or the seller if they don't know the price? And we're gonna talk about this later in the video. Wouldn't, and, and you went back to them and say, hey, give us your highest and best. Maybe the buyer writes more than they originally would. Yes, however, here's the risk. The risk in doing so, and this is what this article's saying, and this has been my experience too, what if the best buyer bows out because of how sensitive the housing market is right now that many buyers 
In fact, as soon as they know there's multiple offers, they're like, nope, I'm out. I can't go through that emotional roller coaster again. I am not willing to compete like that. It's too stressful. I don't know what's going on. And therefore, sometimes the best buyers, you lose them. And another thing the article talks about, which I think is a great, great point, is the buyer who gets a response from their buyer's agent that says, well, there's multiple offers on this property. We have an opportunity to come back with our highest and best offer. They might not even if they even if they want to play ball even if that buyer wants to play ball and they write an offer had they known what the offer was there's a high likelihood that the buyer who really wants the house would just say well just tell me what the price is and I'll tell you if I'm willing to beat it or not and if they had known let's just say the highest offer in this example was 405 that original offer was 395 and they go back at 401 and they still lose had they known it was 405 then I'm like you should have just told me Dum dums, I would have gave me 410 for that. And then the seller loses and the buyer loses. So let's let's keep going through this article and we'll get more into that. So we talked about that. So, so then what happened was 0708 happened, and we had so many foreclosures. And it was through that process that the auction type, or not even the auction, the the highest and best um negotiation tactic was kind of birth because what would happen is you'd have multiple buyers try to buy this foreclosure there would be 25 offers to the bank the bank being you know a bank being lazy not wanting to go through all the offers saying hey we got 25 offer we got we have multiple offers come back with our your highest and best offer it's due by friday by noon none of the buyers would know about any of the offers it was super frustrating if you ever went through that process back in the day and then you'd get an email to say, you lost or you won. And you'd have no idea where your offer stood in the slew or the onslaught of multiple different offers. Then that became standard practice. Our industry adopted that as being standard. And that's what you see today. We still do it every day. It is standard that if you get a multiple offer situation, that people are expecting a highest and best situation. However, the article mentions a couple really, really, really good points that I think he's done a better job articulating than I have in the past that I want to talk about. One of the points on why he believes highest and best is not an actual, uh, is, is not a great strategy is number one, highest and best is not an actual counter offer. Listen to this. This is great. A multiple counter offer to be legitimate needs to have terms that can be accepted. Spot on. If a buyer writes an offer and the seller issues a counter to a number of offers, buyers should be able, if they accept everything, to sign the seller's multiple counter and send it back. If more than one counter comes back signed, then the seller can choose which one they want to accept. When a counter includes highest and best, however, it's not a valid multiple counter because highest and best are not actual terms. They are suggestions. Therefore, to legitimize this practice, if the buyer wants the house, they must produce yet another counter with actual terms that can be accepted or rejected by the seller or simply ignore the multiple counter and let their offer stand as written. He said. Now, he says this. In his opinion, highest and best practices bring out the worst in agents. So now we're talking a bit about it not being great for sellers, not being great for buyers. Now it's not being great for agents. Listing agents are shortcutting their responsibility by refusing to negotiate, which in turn produces frustration on even a more angry buyer agent who are denied access to critical information they need to write effective offers. Additionally, this produces a tremendous amount of reluctance in buyers who, unwilling to throw massive amounts of money into the unknown, tend to respond uh, poorly when setting offer limits or very conservatively. He's saying, and I quote, I have lost number I've lost offers a number of times with buyers when discovering the final contract price 
usually after closing, have stated, I wish they would have told me the price we ha- we had to beat. We would have been willing to go higher than that actual number. So that's what I was talking about before. The problem is, go back to our example of the, of the property listed at 400000 It generates five offers. And you have a buyer who submits an offer not knowing what the other offers. They're just submitting an offer. They're blind. They go in at 397000 Then that night, this dreaded multiple offer situation gets presented to them by their buyer's agent. And the buyer's agent's like, hey, here's the situation. We got to go back. If you want this house, here's what we have to do. The buyer feels a ton of pressure and is dealing with the unknown. So the buyers to their buyer agent often says, well, what do you think we, need, we should do? Buyer agent doesn't have any information and they don't, look, don't want to look like a dumbass in front of their client. So they're just like, I mean, let's just, you know, let's go in as high as, as, high as you're comfortable with. So that person goes back as an example, and they're like, all right, let's go in at 410. Okay, cool. You're comfortable with 410? Yeah, we're comfortable with 410. They resubmit, not knowing where they stack in this slew of offers, hoping and praying, sleepless nights. It's very stressful just to come back and say, you lost. And to which most buyer's agents say, well, lost to what? My buyers want to know. And what do we get? The listing agent says, well, I can't tell you that. You got to wait. And it's like the buyers get so turned off on that. Come to find out based, you know, as an example outlined in the article, that house sells for four. I'm just making the number up. 413. And the buyer's like, 413? Why don't you guys just tell me that? I would have done 425. And now the buyer who really wanted that house, who was willing to outbid the buyer who got the house, doesn't get the house. The seller of that house, who trusted the agents involved in the process, got 413 when they could have gotten 425. They're potentially out money. The buyer's agent's pissed off. And the listing agent is like, well, damn, I could have... I could have got more for my client. He would have made more money. She would have made more money. Everybody would have won had that negotiation gone a different way. Now, even worse is what the article goes on to talk about, is that when that buyer gets into another, when they write an offer on another property that they fall in love with, the second they find out there are multiple offers on the property, many of them are saying, Ain't going through that again. And they withdraw their offer. And that, my friend, is the risk. And, and, you know, they talk about a lot of different things in here too. But that's the risk of calling highest and best. I've been saying this for, damn, it, it seems like more than a decade now. That you have to be very, very careful just to broad brush something. You've got to handle the negotiation with tact, with skills. You have to have high, high emotional intelligence. You got to play chess, not checkers, because the untrained agent acts like the little boy on prom night when there's an offer submitted on, on their listing, and they oftentimes make bad decisions that cost the sellers thousands of dollars and cause buyers to lose properties because... They're just broad brushing and sending an email saying highest and best due Friday by noon. Now, there are times when that could make sense for sure. And I guess what I am asking you to consider is it is just to look at all the options, to play chess, like I said, to not play just checkers, to be more strategic and be aware that there are other negotiating strategies that you might find are better for your client who you are a fiduciary, a fiduciary to, uh, to, that you have a massive responsibility to. So in the comments, before I let you go, give me your thoughts. Highest and best, not highest and best, give me the arguments either way.